NASA announced on June 1 that it had struck deals with two companies to provide spacesuits for International Space Station spacewalks and Artemis moonwalks. Under the terms of the contracts issued for Exploration Extravehicular Activity Services, or XEVAs, teams led by Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace received access to a contract worth up to $3.5 billion to supply spacesuits for future NASA missions through 2034. The existing spacesuit has been the workhorse for the agency for 40 years and uh, has helped maintain uh, and utilize the, the International Space Station as well as construct it. And so of the 250 spacewalks that our partners and, and we have done on onboard space station, 169 of those have been with the existing spacesuit. And so uh, the spacesuit technology, though, of course, uh, at 40 years um, is now um, aging. And so we'd like to try new future technologies. The goal is to replace the aging shuttle era suits with a version that could be worn by moonwalkers of the Artemis III lunar landing mission, currently scheduled for no earlier than 2025. NASA will also conduct an orderly transition from existing decades-old suits on the ISS to the new suits around the same time. Whether Axiom and Collins will develop a common suit design for both uses or two substantially different designs is up to the engineers. This is a historic day for us. And uh, the history will be made with these suits uh, when we get to the moon. Uh, we will have our first person of color and our first woman that will be wearers and users of these suits in space. The commercial partners will be responsible for the design, development, qualification, certification, and production of spacesuits and support equipment. The suits would feature state-of-the-art communications and computer technology and common life support systems with more robust reserves for emergencies. The new suits weigh less than the current generation spacesuits, allowing for increased mission times. The lunar version would feature enhanced mobility for walking, bending down, and back up in a gravity field on uneven surfaces. The suits are also designed to accommodate nearly every astronaut body type and can rapidly incorporate new technologies. The companies will own the suits they develop and will effectively rent them to NASA for space station and Artemis missions. Collins Aerospace designed the first spacesuit that allowed astronauts to walk on the moon as well as the suit NASA astronauts currently use when operating outside the International Space Station. Axiom Space wasn't even a glimmer in NASA's eye back in the Apollo era. The Texas-based company was founded only six years ago, but it has quickly risen to prominence in the commercial space race. Both companies said they expected to have spacesuits ready for testing on the ISS and for the Artemis III mission by the mid-2020s. NASA will evaluate the performance and select one or both suit designs for continued development and operational use. Nearly six months after it was launched on a cloudy day from French Guiana, the James Webb Space Telescope is all set to send back its first full-color image from 1.5 million kilometers away. According to a NASA statement posted on June 1, the Flying Observatory will send back its first images and spectroscopic data on 12 July. Webb required several months of preparation before starting science work. The process included cooling the telescope to its operating temperature, calibrating instruments, and aligning the mirrors. NASA has shared some images that the telescope captured during the preparation phase, but they were all interim alignment images taken to evaluate the observatory's capabilities. The July 12 images will come after each instrument is calibrated, tested, and given the green light by its science and engineering team. NASA emphasized that despite all the months of careful alignment since the December 25 launch of Webb, it is difficult to predict exactly how the new images will look. However, the new images will be available in full color and will be meant to show the breadth of Webb's science capabilities. After the observatory captures its first images properly, it will focus on its first year of operations, called Cycle 1. NASA has already published the list of planned investigations following a competition within the science community to determine the highest priority work. Blue Origin's New Shepard suborbital vehicle made its fifth crewed flight on June 4, carrying six people to space from the company's West Texas launch site. The mission, designated NS-21, was previously scheduled to launch on May 20, but Blue Origin delayed it due to a problem with an unspecified backup system on the New Shepard rocket. Blue Origin's first repeat customer, Evan Dick, who flew on the NS-19 mission in December 2021, was among the six people on board. Check out the link in the description to learn more about all six passengers. The capsule separation took place at about three minutes after liftoff, and the spacecraft spent about four minutes in microgravity. The crew reached a peak altitude of 106 km during the flight, and the capsule achieved a top speed of 3,600 km per hour. The New Shepard capsule and its six passengers touched down under parachutes just over 10 minutes later, sending up a plume of desert dust as it hit the ground. 
The booster came down shortly before the capsule did, making a powered vertical landing. The capsule and booster will be returned to the processing facilities for their next flight. Blue Origin has now flown five missions into suborbital space, carrying 25 people, and plans to nearly double that number by the end of this year. China successfully launched the Shenzhou-14 astronaut mission to their Tiangong space station at 2.44 a.m. UTC on June 5. The three Shenzhou-14 crew members, Commander Chen Dong, Operator Liu Yang, and Kai Shuz, were launched from the Jiaquin Satellite Launch Center in the Gobi Desert atop a Long March 2F rocket. After a journey of less than seven hours, the Shenzhou spacecraft carrying the Taikonauts, or the Chinese astronauts, docked with the station's Tianhou Core Module 400 kilometers above the ground. The three Shenzhou 14 crew members will spend about six months aboard the station. They will be on board to receive two new space station modules, Wentin and Mentin, which will launch in late July and October, respectively. Those two coming missions will see the completion of the T-shaped space station. The team will also meet the crew of the Shenzhou 15 mission when it launches later this year. The Shenzhou 14 trio are also expected to embark on spacewalks, install new equipment both inside and outside the space station, engage in outreach activities, and perform science experiments. They are scheduled to return to Earth in December. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After a week of repairs, the upgraded Starship prototype, Starship 24, passed its first cryogenic proof test on June 2. A week before, on May 27, Ship 24 had suffered some internal damage during an ambient temperature pressure test with nitrogen gas. For about a week after that first test, SpaceX teams extracted damaged plumbing and carefully transported replacement parts inside. The replaced pipe had multiple expansion loops in it, which will increase the flexibility of the piping and prevents thermal expansion and contraction from causing excessive stresses in the piping system. The damaged pipe removed two weeks ago lacked these expansion loops, which could explain why it failed when pressurized. On June 2, Ship 24 was resealed, and SpaceX began filling the prototype with sub-cooled liquid nitrogen. The main tanks of Ship 24 were completely filled in about 70 minutes, gradually raising the pressure inside the propellant tanks. SpaceX detanked and depressurized Ship 24 after about an hour, marking the end of the cryo test. Elon Musk later confirmed that Ship 24 had passed its first cryoproof test. However, it should be noted that no activity was detected in Ship 24's nose section during the cryoproof test. Ship 24 is the first Starship prototype with a new design that incorporates both header tanks into the nose cone's tip. Moreover, the nose cone also features a number of other manufacturing and design upgrades. So ensuring that it works as expected is critical. It is currently unclear whether SpaceX will conduct a cryoproof test on Ship 24's header tanks. Two days after passing the cryoproof test, SpaceX moved Ship 24 to the suborbital launch pad A to begin the structural stress test. During the test, hydraulic actuators will press on the ship's aft section to simulate the thrust and mechanical stress of the six Raptor engines. At the same time, the prototype will also be filled with subcooled liquid nitrogen. Road closures indicate that structural tests will begin as soon as Monday, June 6. Once Ship 24 has passed the structural test campaign, SpaceX will remove the hydraulic rams and begin installing Raptor engines for the static fire test campaign. Ship 24's partner, Super Heavy Booster 7, is currently being assembled inside the Mega Bay. The booster's four grid fins were installed over the last week. Booster 7 grid fins are much denser than previous ones, meaning they have more grids. Next, Booster 7 will be outfitted with all 33 Raptor version 2 engines, each capable of producing nearly 2.3 mega newtons of thrust. On May 31, Elon Musk revealed that SpaceX engineers would fully stack Ship 24 and Booster 7 in a few weeks, and that all the Raptor V2 engines required for the first orbital flight are complete and being installed. This could include the three sea level and three vacuum optimized Raptor engines of Starship 24. For the last month or so, SpaceX has been spotted delivering Raptor V2 engines to the build site, implying that all 39 engines may already be on-site at Starbase. If some are still being tested at SpaceX's McGregor rocket development facility, it may be a few weeks before all required engines arrive. Musk also confirmed that SpaceX would proceed cautiously with its Booster 7 static fire campaign, initially testing engines one at a time, before moving on to a full 33-engine test. In addition to preparing Ship 24 and Booster 7 for upcoming ground tests, SpaceX is also rapidly filling the massive storage tanks at the tank farm with liquid methane and liquid oxygen required for wet dress rehearsals and static fire testing. 
While works at Starbase are rapidly progressing, SpaceX is still awaiting the experimental permits and vehicle operator license to conduct Starship launch operations. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has announced that the environmental review and permitting processes, which were supposed to be released on May 31, will now be released on June 13. This is the fifth time the FAA has delayed the review. Along with the announcement, FAA also released redacted comments on draft programmatic environmental assessment. NASA made an interesting comment, stating that the agency has special expertise and interest in the operation of Starship vehicles, which are intended to help foster the development of the commercial reusable space transportation industry. Just two days after the FAA's announcement, the online portal tracking the progress of the environmental assessment has been updated to show that the final step requiring interagency consultations was completed on June 2. It's now quite likely that the environmental review will finally be completed by June 13, allowing the FAA and SpaceX to focus solely on the launch license side of the equation. According to FAA, SpaceX's launch license application must meet FAA safety, risk, and financial responsibility requirements. Once all types of ground tests have been completed, regulatory approvals have been received, the tank farm is fully operational, and Stage 0 is fully ready, Starship 24, on top of Super Heavy Booster 7, will lift off from South Texas for the first ever orbital flight test of a Starship prototype. Now, let's move on to other Starship updates. Super Heavy Booster 8 assembly works are progressing at the build site. On May 31, workers moved the aft section, also known as the thrust section of the booster, into the high bay. The following day, teams stacked the oxygen tank section of the booster on top of the aft section. The tank section was moved from the high bay to the mega bay for further assembly operations on Sunday morning. Booster 8 stacking will be completed once the methane tank section is secured atop the oxygen tank section, which will happen in a few days. The booster quick disconnect plumbing shield, which was removed from the orbital launch mount two weeks ago after a fit check, was returned to the build site on June 2. SpaceX teams recently installed flame diverters on the legs of the orbital launch pad. The flame deflector safely deflects the plume exhaust from the booster's 33 Raptor engines to the side, protecting the launch pad's six legs. The Starship orbital launch pad construction inside the gates of Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center is progressing. All six legs of the launch pad at Kennedy are now vertical. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.